welcome to our service of morning prayer. Following ancient Jewish and monastic tradition, the Episcopal Church has long observed the tradition of daily prayer, morning, noon, evening, and night. The service can be led by anyone and can be celebrated anywhere. It is particularly suited for those Sundays when, as a congregation, we are unable to gather. The service begins on page 38 of your Book of Common Prayer. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation, and so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him let us stand in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Almighty and merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from our grace like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Jesus Christ our Lord. And grant, O merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty and merciful Lord, grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. 
Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. A reading from Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out of the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them, and there were, there were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus say the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus say the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, and they shall live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are of the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus say the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil, and then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
from the Gospel according to John. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her, also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. 
Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you all I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Grace and peace to you, my friends in Christ. I'm glad to be speaking to you today, albeit from a distance. I miss you. And I look forward to the time when we will be reunited. As Reverend Susan noted in her sermon last week, the lectionary readings seem perfectly suited for these times, perfectly suited for this moment we face as a church, as a community, and as the global human family. You may already know that the story of Jesus raising Lazarus is the the turning point of the entire Gospel of John. In the synoptic Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the turning point is Peter's confession of Jesus as Messiah. In this Gospel, it is Martha who confesses. It is Martha who puts her trust in the person of Jesus. And it is Jesus himself who proclaims the good news in a powerful I am statement and follows that bold claim with a bold miracle that becomes too much for the religious authorities to handle. In other words, the Lazarus story in John's gospel is the hinge point that moves the gospel narrative forward into the events of what the Eastern Orthodox Church calls the Great Week. For the decision to give life to Lazarus leads to death for Jesus. And so it is the right gospel for this Sunday, this final Sunday of Lent, as we anticipate the burden of walking with Jesus in the suffering and sorrow of Holy Week. And it is the right gospel for the time that we are in today, a time where we are starting to feel the weight of this pandemic, starting to feel the burden of the disruption, starting to understand the suffering of others, or perhaps in big or small ways, feeling the load of loss ourselves. In this pandemic situation, we resonate with our scriptures. Like the reading from Ezekiel, We know that there are some in our midst who will feel like the whole house of Israel. Our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Even if we don't feel quite so desperate ourselves, perhaps we enjoy good health, financial security, childcare options, a job that we can work from home. There are far too many who are vulnerable who are this desperate, or who will be before long. The odd thing about living as we do and where we do is that we don't frequently see suffering on a massive scale. Our modernity modernity means that we sometimes fail to face suffering squarely. Suffering is reduced to a concept or an anomaly. And it is far too easy for us to be lost in a consuming boredom or anxiety. It is far too easy for us to change the channel or keep scrolling or say, give us a few weeks and we'll get past all this. But the reality is that there is loss here. Whether the losses that we've faced in the past few days are big or small, 
we seem to be entering a season of grief. And we can expect all of grief's attendants to come along. Anger, denial, and the if-onlys we could have. We are one with Mary and Martha as they grieve the death of their brother. And I resonate with other aspects of this gospel, and I wonder if you do too. Why does Jesus wait to go to Bethany? Why? I feel a sense of confusion and even a little anger at his absence in this gospel, even with all the parenthetical explanations. I feel the weight of the Lord's absence as Mary and Martha did. We are waiting, waiting, waiting for Christ to show up and heal. And I can't blame Martha for her reproachful observation that if Jesus had been present, this catastrophe would not have happened. And so we, with Mary and Martha, are waiting and weeping. And this is where we find ourselves today. Or if we don't yet, perhaps we will, or perhaps we should, or perhaps we must, because it is only in the weeping and the waiting with Mary and Martha that we find that Jesus weeps too. Lent and Holy Week call us to face the brokenness of everything. From Ash Wednesday, when we remember that we are but dust, to Good Friday, when we stand with Jesus, to open wide our entire beings to the suffering of the world, we do so in grief. But my friends, weeping is not the end of the story. It is only the middle of the story. After he sheds quiet tears, Jesus does an absolutely absurd thing. Roll back the stone, he says. In the realness and the stench of grief and death, Jesus says, roll back the stone. And we think you must be crazy, Jesus. And Jesus cries with a loud voice to the one who is dead, come out. Come out from the prison that holds you. Come out and be unbound. Come out and live. We are an Easter people. And we are Easter people now, even in the middle of COVID-19, even in the middle of waiting and weeping. We know that the story does not end at the tomb. We know that our Messiah not only waits and weeps with us, but proclaims and calls us with urgency to second chances. As Easter people, we are called to see new life that both recognizes our mortality and makes the audacious claim that this is not the final word. In the midst of all the bad and scary news, haven't we all experienced moments of uplift in the past few days? In the midst of all of our news feeds, haven't we also seen the musicians who have come together for virtual songs, the teddy bears placed in windows so that school children can see them, the silly jokes that give us a much needed laugh, the sacrifices by first responders and doctors and nurses who are charged to care for all of us in our community. In the past few days, I have been inspired by those who have delivered groceries and mail. I have laughed at funny memes. I have stood in awe at the many ways that I have witnessed the power of Christian hope. And it inspires me to bear witness to this Christian hope, even as I grieve my own losses and those of others. And so, even while we wait and weep, as Easter people, we also witness 
to the power of love and hope. I am reminded by, of our baptismal vows in the Book of Common Prayer. In the baptismal covenant, after renouncing the evil in the wor world, we are asked, will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? My friends, a pandemic is a wonderful and amazing time to see and to be the good news of God in Christ. In the midst of the waiting and the weeping, what will be our Christian witness? What good word and what good example can we share today with our spouse, with our child, with our neighbor down the street, with a person stocking the grocery store shelves, with our postal carrier, with the most vulnerable among us. Our gospel gives us a pattern for living in this unusual time. We weep with those who weep, we wait in hope, and we bear witness to the ongoing work of resurrection. It is an audacious thing to sing Alleluia in the midst of scarcity, illness, and fear. We can only do so if we follow Jesus' example of first entering deeply into the sorrow and suffering of our world, and then boldly calling forth life from death. When we do so, we can say our Alleluia's confidently without them ringing hollow or sounding absurd. For we know as Easter people that God promises to bring new life out of our loss. God promises to send the Spirit into the places that are dead and dry and to help us live anew. And God's promises stand even in the midst of a pandemic.
O oh, Almighty God, who alone canst order the unruly wills and affections of sinful men, grant unto thy people that they may love the thing which thou commandest, and desire that which thou dost promise, that so, among the sundry and manifold changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed, where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Let us pray for those in our congregation and community. For healing and recovery, Ruth, Libby, Robert, Annabelle, the Robinson family, the Hooper family, Bishop Susan. We continue to pray for Ronald and Nancy, parents of Allison Hall, Judy, mother of Jennifer O'Rourke, Douglas, brother of John Duvall, Doreen, sister of Don Mench, Mary Beth, Robin Michael's sister, Betty, Karen Lund's mother, Rand, Gary Welschenbach's friend. For those in our parish, Allison, Maisie, Desiree, Karen, David, Stephanie, Jack, Bruce, Bob, and Xander. And for those celebrating birthdays, Eric Menge, Kate Costello, Len Leroy. Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time and with one accord to make our common supplication unto thee, and hast promised through thy well-beloved Son, that when two or three are gathered together in his name, thou wilt be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen.